Good evening, and welcome to CITI Media Reporter. I'm Howard Hamanoff, and thank you for joining us tonight. My guest this evening is Danny Bennett, the mastermind behind his father Tony Bennett's career in the music business for much of the last three decades. And Danny, thank you for joining us. Great mastermind sounds <laughs> villainous. You, you, well, uh, in, in a good way, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so we were, you know, we were chatting right before we got started here, and it sort of immediately uh, raises a question for me, which is. The, the so much success and uh, of of Tony's career, you know, we can go back many many decades. But certainly, I'm, I'm I'm thinking in the last, you know, the kind of MTV generation forward, and probably which is most probably so much surprised people from the outside. Maybe yeah. how much of that is the serendipity of who knew versus wow? Here's the here's here's kind of the 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 thoughtful uh, crafted approach yeah. to how we're going to do this. Um, well, I mean, it's a good question and, and, a, and a hard one to answer because, you know, we, we were talking about how important the stars being aligned is to, you know, anything that we do in, in, in this industry, or any industry, right. really. Sure. Um, you know, you can hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the advantage, it's, and, and what's a little difficult for me to answer, is the advantage I have is having grown up in the industry, in the business. Um, uh, uh, Tony's first contract with Columbia Records is a page and a half. Um, and I've had, again, the opportunity... The lunch contract would be much longer than that today. Exactly, so, right, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, I've had the advantage of being able to read... this. He's been with Columbia Records since 1951 and, and continues to be there. Um, and so it, it's interesting, um, and it's a, a, actually it would be a great class in the, to itself. To read the con you read the contract from the page and a half to now where it's uh, you know 240 pages, um, but you see the you know you actually witness and see the evolution of of you know the industry um, through the word which is which is which was pretty interesting for me um, when I got involved with uh, Tony uh, and I call him Tony professionally because <laughs> um, it's tough to say you know Dad needs more royalties or, you know, in advance. Um, you know, taken seriously. Um, the, the advantage um, uh, was that in 19, around 1979, the industry was coming out of the 60s. It was a very difficult time for artists such as Tony and Sinatra and Streisand and, right. you know, people who were doing what they, now, what they call middle-of-the-road music. Um, uh, the onslaught of the Beatles in the 60s took everyone by by surprise. Um, the, uh, into the 70s, we kind of got more into the corporate rock aspect of things. And those artists were kind of put aside, except for a couple of the, you know, the hits. Tony had San Francisco and Once in My Life and, and, and Shadow Your Smile, Sinatra, I Did It My Way, and those kind of things. Um, Streisand kind of reinvented herself with these duet records that she right. did, yeah. kind of yeah. almost right. disco-ish. Um, so, you know, it was, it was interesting to see that evolution. So, in 79, when I got involved with Tony, um, uh, he was doing a lot of Vegas, and Vegas was changing. It was like 18 hours, uh, 18 weeks um, contracts and kind of getting stuck there. And, and I've always had an appreciation for the, the art of what he does, all right? And one of the great stories that I learned very early on, time when uh, around the dinner table, um, an attorney became the president of Columbia Records. And now that sounds passe, but at the time when Johnny Mercer owned Capitol Records, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sinatra had reprise, it was artist, an artist-run business. Now all of a sudden, a lawyer was going to be a president. This was unheard of. Um, and who was the lawyer? Clive Davis. Clive Davis. <laughs> he's done okay for himself. He's done, he's done fine. <laughs> Uh, but at the time, it was a very, very jarring and shocking thing. And the, 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 uh, the impulse was to um, kind of fit the artist to marketing, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, you got to do more contemporary songs. People were doing, you know, um, you know Beatles songs and those kind of things. Um, uh, and it wasn't working for Tony uh, and a lot of artists at the time. It wasn't true to the art. Um, so... The, the, the story that was kind of um, made a difference for me 
in terms of my attitude, and I'm getting to the point about how, why um, it's important to understand how and what came first, chicken or the egg. Right, yeah. um, Duke Ellington was with Columbia Records, and at the time, he, Tony told me he saw him at the studio. He was going to see, uh, he, as he said, the boss, Clive <laughs> Davis, to, to, get a, uh, uh, to get a raise. Um, he went into Clive's office, and Clive said, uh, you know, Duke, uh, I have some news for you. Um, we're going to have to drop you from the label. And Duke said, why? I don't understand. He goes, well, you're not selling enough records. And, and Duke said, well, I really don't understand. I thought I was supposed to make them, and you were supposed to sell them. <laughs> okay, so that's a, and then he walked out. So th that was a very kind of crucial moment for me to understand that our job as marketers, okay, is to fit the marketing to the artist and find ways to take the true artist and, and bring that to a larger audience. And it's a lot more difficult to do, but it stays true to the, the legacy. I often say I don't handle a, a career, I handle a legacy. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a whole different attitude in terms of you don't just take the money and run um, because it's an investment, it's a long-term investment, it has to be a, a solid foundation. So when I started working with him, I felt that when I watched him perform, that he trans his music transcended for me. And, and, and I thought, hey, nobody says that you have to be a certain age to go see Van Gogh in a museum, right? right yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a simple concept, but, uh, right. but so I was convinced that it just, like, like a president, like running for president, I think that's kind of what I did with Tony, is got him to the people um, put him in front of college uh, folks at the time, put him on shows that, it was at one point <laughs> we were doing a college show, Tony was performing with Between Nine Inch Nails and PJ Harvey in front of 60,000 <laughs> kids. Tony turns to me and says, um, can I ask you something, would Frank do this? And I said, no he wouldn't, and that's exactly why we're doing it. And so he got it, and Tony's a brilliant in terms of understanding um, the, the, what's necessary in order to to, to, to create your own, you know, your own niche and your own environment. Well, how do you, you know, that... that Does that answer your question? I know it's a roundabout way, well, but it's important yeah, I mean, to understand the distinction. Right, no, I think there it feels to me like there's both, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there are certain things that, <clears throat> that if the stars weren't aligned, don't happen, but you, you know, you, you also got to manage the stars, uh, no pun intended. You know, a, a little bit. Um, Meet opportunity with preparedness. Yeah. That's what Tony always says. Yeah. And 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 it's true. If yeah. you don't, if you're not willing to take chances, if you're not willing to, I don't even like to call them mistakes because they're not mistakes. Um, uh, you know, Steve Ross, who 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 ran Time Warner. Right. What, you know, he would never fire somebody for making a mistake because he used to say, if you made a mis if you were making mis if you weren't making mistakes. You weren't moving the, the needle. Yeah. And if you're not moving the needle, I don't want to yeah. be working yeah. with you. Yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's an important lesson. So in managing a legacy, um, what guides you in the decisions, you know, from the broad strategy to the specifics of we'll do this event, we won't do this event, I'll have yeah. Tony dress up like this, but I won't have him do that. How much of that is just the gut versus, I don't know, how much, you know, you can research that or, or use data to help you with it, but, but w mm. what's that mix of, of <laughs> to, to guide a, deci you know, a bunch of decisions which just feel, you, you add the word legacy to it, it takes on more weight than eh, you know, the, here today, gone tomorrow. I, I, I mean, for me, it's a simple, I mean, it sounds simple, and like I said, my advantage is that I've grown up in the business, so I've seen a lot of, early on in my life, I've seen a lot of successes and failures. Um, I, I grew up in the 60s with the Beatles, I have to, I mean, I have to admit that, you know, they wore everything on their sleeve. So not only were, in terms of the music, in a very short period of time, really, 64 yeah. to 69, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you had not only from the music side taking chances and pushing the envelope, but a cultural move with every record that they did. Um, uh, they were very open about their private lives and their business lives. And, and if you were involved with that, you, you saw it and understood it. Um, <clears throat> I learned a lot from that. I learned how marketing is not a bad word. It's, about, it's the balance of art and commerce. The Beatles were experts at the balance of art and commerce. They made their, their, their commerce, they made their marketing 
a, an integral, fun part of what it was that they were trying to do artistically. Um, and they didn't shy away from that. Um, so the selling out aspect was not, um, uh, wasn't important to them. Uh, uh, doing a song in two minutes and 50 seconds became a canvas. It's a challenge for them. So they, they reveled in that. Um, uh, their, 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 they were, their, their heroes were Buddy Holly and the Everly yeah, Brothers. Yeah. And, and so they, they took an album to mean that it was a, um, a, a collection of singles, <laughs> which, is, which is really interesting because they didn't have albums. They grew up on singles. Does it take, does the artist have to be an integral part of the marketing? For it to, to for it to succeed, or can somebody else? I mean, you're in a pretty you, unique position that you know it's it's your father, yeah, or yeah, it's you know yeah. kind of literally growing up with the artist and and you know and his art. But how yeah. much does the artist need to be involved versus the you, you know the Duke Ellington? You sell, I'll I'll make records. As as a marketer, I believe you need to listen. Um, and it's not so much that the art, the artist is always involved. The artist oh, it always starts there because you can't, unless, you know, uh, look, there's McDonald's and then there's Tiffany's, right? right? So 3 billion hamburgers sold. You can do that. And a lot of people are going to like that. Um, and, you know, politics, same thing. You can have Ronald Reagan who will listen to what everybody says, or you're going to have Obama who's going to march to, this, to his own drum, right? So it depends on who the artist is, but when, for a true artist with a with a with a uh, uh, with a legacy and 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 a and a, hist and, and a future, um, you have to very you have to listen to what that artist wants to achieve, and then as a marketer, understand and figure out ways that you're going to be able to to, to nurture that and reach it. We have when I say we now, notice I just naturally say that <laughs> yeah. I have a team of people that I work with, right. and and it's not just one person. It's a team of people that we've ha I've had for 25 years over you know over this period of time, um, and they really understand uh, what what it is that we're going after, and it's important for us to keep true to that. We need to reinvent Tony every year, which is strange. I mean, if you think about this. We reinvent Tony, but he does the same thing. <laughs> right. He's singing the Great American Songbook. Right, He's right, right. But see, Tony is always taking chances himself with his music. And so it's not attention to him. When you say, <clears throat> excuse me, you're reinventing him every year, it is an attention that, hey, nobody needs to reinvent. I mean, it's sort of a, kind of a part of what you just have to do. What generational, if we don't keep an eye on the, the upcoming generation. So, you know, we just did, we just did this Cheek to Cheek right. with Lady Gaga. Um, our first duets record, which, you know, Tony has sold 10 million records in the last 10 years, which is pretty incredible with all this, like, talk of, oh, no, no one, one sells records seat. anymore, right. no yeah. one's buying yeah. anymore. Yeah. And here's Tony selling 10 million records. You know, Adele sent, sell 10 million records of the one record, you know, over an eight-year period. Over an eight-year period, Tony's, you know, yeah. so you have to look at it that yeah. way. Um, so it, 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 it's pretty interesting from that, you know, from that perspective. What it, uh, you know, Cheek to Cheek um, really has been such a phenomenal success. Oh, what I was going to say, I'm sorry, but like Lady Gaga in our first 2006, how old right. was she? You know, she's 28 right. now, right. Yeah. you know, and right. you look right. at it and you go like, oh my goodness, it's, it's 20 year right. anniversary of MTV Unplugged. Um, and those quote unquote kids that were listening to Tony, uh, I considered I was really going for 30-year-olds and those yeah. guys, but they're they're approaching 50. Right. Yeah. And that's you you you're you're vested you're invested in in your it's kind of building your infrastructure and and we continue to do so. So with Lady Gaga and that audience knowing who Tony Bennett is and understanding that there's other it's I mean for me the biggest the biggest accomplishment that that Tony achieved in the in the 90s with MTV Unplugged is he really heralded in the iTunes. Um, you know, the, the, the iTunes generation, where it's okay to have the Pixies and Nirvana and Pearl Jam yeah. oh, and Billy Holiday and Tony Bennett, it's okay. Yeah. And it wasn't okay before that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's hit one of his greatest accomplishments, and he continues to do it, and he's 88 years old. <laughs> well, you know, it reminds me, <clears throat> and, and you, you, had, you had produced, or your, your team had produced this, this terrific documentary a couple years ago, oh. The Zen of Bennett, yeah. Um, which I really loved, and and there's this great moment where um, I think it's around the, the John Mayer session, and, yeah. and Tony says, you know, everybody's, I don't do demographics. Everybody's I, favorite part. I, I, I don't do demographics. You know, I sing to all the people. Um, so at the risk of 
upsetting your father, what do the demographics look like for, uh, the, do you, how much do you, do you pay attention to that in terms of who's buying cheek to cheek or who's buying the tickets, you know, for events and things? What, what is that? What does it look like, and what's it telling you? Well, the interesting thing about that section, which is everyone's favorite section, and and is my oh, I most, thought it was I was unique in that. Well, it was my no okay. no no. It's my most <laughs> but it's my most uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's great. It's, it's great. It's it's um, great. It's it's great on film. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what's great about it, I'll tell you, and for me, is that we don't pay attention to demographics, and that's how we're successful with it. If we were paying attention to demographics, then we would say, uh, no, we can't, uh, no, well, we shouldn't go there. We, don't, we go everywhere, right? So that's what I was explaining in the film. But for, from, from Tony's point of view, he's just, he's so zeroed in on, he doesn't like demographics. He doesn't really understand that that's exactly what we're accomplishing, <laughs> but that's okay yeah, because yeah. He's, in, he's in the eye of the storm. Yeah. And I often say to him that you're in the eye of the storm, but you know, when we're, oh, I'm walking down the street, it happened to us, you know, last spring, school bus drives by, but I'm talking about middle school kids chanting Tony and waving. <laughs> and he just stared at me and goes, ah, <laughs> this is incredible. Yeah. So to a certain extent for him, it's, it's a little bit of, uh, it's a little bit unbelievable, yeah. right? For yeah. me, it's not. I'm like, there, oh, there you go. Yeah. You know, yeah. what demographics? <laughs> So how, how have you, from a marketing perspective, how are, have things changed for you in the last, you know, five years, 10, 25, in terms of the way you take, again, a guy doing the same stuff <clears throat> to some degree, which is, again, those great songs and, you know, and he's still... Got the, got the tie and the well, look, what is, right? What did he say you in the film? He said, my tie. He says, I, I like to be different. <laughs> yeah, or, I mean, well, there I, you go, though. There it is. <laughs> so, but, but, but marketing that, how, yeah. do you, how have you been changing, uh, you know, dealing with social media and, and online video and all these other platforms, how's that been changing yeah. for you? Well, uh, and again, Vantage growing up in the business, um, we, you know, we, the studio business, uh, wiring and building studios, being in bands. Uh, technology's never scared me. Um, I think that our industry has stumbled uh, because you had a lot of people who didn't understand the technology. As far as I'm concerned, it's all data, right? So it's like water. It flows. And it doesn't matter what pipe you put in. If it's a jukebox or if it's Spotify, yeah. to me, they're the same thing. Yeah. Um, it, it, it satisfies the same need. Your, your public relations is the same. Is it magazines? Is it people? Life magazine? We don't have Life magazine anymore. Ah, but we have Facebook and we have social. It, it, we're able to reach the fans directly, which is something everybody loved to do. The Beatles had their fan club religiously. Every Christmas, they'd get you. They do a Christmas message. You said, "I mean, it's it's all the same principle. Um, it's just that we have greater opportunity right now." Um, and and understanding the most important thing is to understand your tools. All right. So in business school, you learn your tools. Um, everyone has the same paints, right? Um, the difference between Rembar Rembrandt and the Impressionists were that the paints changed. They got brighter colors, all right? And Gauguin and Van Gogh, they painted differently. Monet did different. We all have the same tool set. It depends on what our creativity is, and that's something you can't learn in school. Uh, Danny, one of the things I want to ask you a little bit more about is the technology around the business and how much... You know, people think in a creative endeavor, oh, you know, I'm a creative guy, right? I'll let somebody else know technology. But how much did you have to learn a technology, understand it to be able to succeed in the, you know, the whole creative and marketing enterprise? Yeah, I mean, it's like saying understanding your tools is the most important part of, of, of anything being creative. If you're an artist, you have to understand how to mix colors, you know, if you're a painter. Um, and, and understanding the studio... Um, so that as an artist, you, you can get what it is that you're going after. Producers play a, a huge role there, um, but it's always great when you have artists who understand production and can eliminate the middleman. It's always, it's always a great thing. But for me, I never, was never scared of technology, and I, I, view tech, uh, I view music now as data, whether it's on a, on a wax disc, whether it's on a CD, whether it's on, you know, through uh, broadband, it, it matters little to me. And the basic components, the 101 of marketing, 
of fan clubs, social networking, of distribution, they're all the same. So, you know, uh, the jukebox came about when somebody had the smart idea of like, hey, people don't, can't listen to their records when they go out and eat, right? Right. And, they, and it's like, well, we have radio. Well, no, but that means that they can't choose what they want. So someone came up with the idea of putting records in a box where people could put money in and choose what they want to hear. It, it's what we're doing today, right? right? Choice. Um, and to me, it's, it's just the same thing. I, you know, um, I am a huge believer in, 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 in subscription base and that we'll get whatever we want. And that's, that's books, that's music, any cultural arts. And it's a wonderful thing. It's just that our industry has stumbled um, with it. Um, you know, Spotify is, 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 is a great thing. Uh, let's take out Spotify. Streaming, <laughs> streaming companies <laughs> are, are going to be a wonderful thing. Uh, but artists aren't getting paid what they should. Um, and um, there are various reasons for that. And, and, one, and, and as far as I'm concerned, it's again, comes down to 101. If you give your product away, no one's going to buy it. And I've had a hard time talking this through with a lot of different people. If artists get paid for it and they want to get and the labels want to give it away, that's fine with me. But the idea here is, is that artists need to get paid for what they do. Um, and that's the most important thing. But you see, Taylor Swift took the, the bold move of not putting a record up on streaming. Why? Because she sold four million records. Um, and, and, and with, you know, cheek to cheek, it was very important for me. I didn't have the ability to keep it off streaming. But, um, you know, I felt that Gaga's audience, if given the choice of buying a record for fifteen ninety nine or streaming it for free, it doesn't, it seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, I want to ask you about the labels. And, you yeah. know, the, um, there's been so much written over so long a period of time about the, kind of the music industry's slow and or, you know, uh, the, the, the failure to deal, whether fast enough or well enough, with the digital revolution. You've been with Columbia, or Tony's been with Columbia since 1951, I think you said. Yeah. Where is the label, how important is the label still to you um, or you can make it more broadly, not necessarily you or only oh, you know, Tony's general. business, but how important are, are still the labels today versus, you know, does it just not matter and every, we're all entrepreneurs at this? Um, <laughs> it's a really hard question to answer um, because I think that it would, it would take a semester. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I mean, it, and it yeah. deserves it too because I think it, it is important to understand how, the, how it has stumbled and what can be done. I just know that my, I cut my teeth on the fact that Tony didn't have the normal um, avenues like radio, right? So, you know, at, in the 90s when everyone was switching over from vinyl to CDs, there was this huge upsurge. People, you know, again, um, you know, the, the old adage of when the tide goes out, you can see who's wearing bathing suits. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're at the point where the tide is out. Yeah. Um, so I, my adage is, and I always say this, is that when business is good and you do bad business, it's okay. But when business is bad and you're doing bad business, you better look out. And, and we're seeing that happen now. Um, and and uh, uh, Steve Jobs came in at a time and was smart about it and spent money marketing. Um, he wasn't really concerned about the music. He wanted to sell hardware. But I think that's why Sony bought CBS or Columbia Records to begin with um, and somehow lost you know, lost their way with that. Um, but Steve Jobs stepped in, did what needed to happen. Napster came along and we didn't embrace it. They tried to fight it. Um, and those are huge mistakes, huge mistakes. Um, so, you know, 100% of nothing is nothing, <laughs> you know, at a certain point. So, yeah, you know, they own masters, but at the same time, is, you know, they be, you, know you, you kind of back themselves into a corner to be possibly become obsolete because if you have distribution, self-distribution, just like self-publishers yeah. now, right? Yeah. Um, why do you need a publisher? Well, you like advances, yeah. but then no one's paying advances anymore. Okay. So, so, you know, right. what, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then it's like, well, well, you know, when you start becoming successful, we'll give you money. And you're going like, well, when I'm, begin that, when I'm successful, I don't need then your I don't money. need you, right. You know, right. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's yeah, a yeah. conundrum. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot that people can do on the independent side, or have done on the independent side. I worked on a Pearl Jam record, Backspace, or they didn't have a label. 
Um, and, you know, with Tony, we had to make deals, third-party deals to, you know, our industry doesn't have the kind of marketing dollars like the movie industry can spend 40 million, 50 million yeah, promoting. Yeah. Well, we just don't have that. So um, I had, a, I had a, an acronym, OPIUM, uh, Other People's Money, OPM. Um, and we, I, I applied that throughout the early 2000s. How, how about the broadcast business in terms of as a marketing tool or as a business today? What's your perspective on you know, radio, particularly to a lesser extent television? You obviously made great use of it with MTV in the, you know, in the 90s. But particularly talk about the radio business and how important well, let's talk is about, that still? Well, let's talk about TV a okay. little bit. But yeah. like, you know, you need to be bold. Um, and, and one of the things that we did with 2006 was we did the deal with Target. Huge, great partners for us. It wasn't just like your week-long, 10-day thing. We, you know, I pitched kind of a six-month in, in, uh, uh, partnership where we educate the consumer. It's important to educate the consumer so they understand what's coming. And it's not just a, a flash in the pan. And they don't, again, they, they feel... A sense did you of have discovery. To educate, did you have to educate Target in that before yeah. you educate the uh, yeah, consumer? Yeah, of course, yeah. of course, yeah. because it's like Tony Bennett and Target. Like what? Like right. they were, you know, why would we do that? Right. Well, you know, we we talked about doing, you know, D Tony's birthday on August third, releasing the record in September, um, and then having uh, a, I I kind of pitched this idea of, of a television special around Thanksgiving that was brought to you by Target. Target presents just like the, you know, the, the old, old days. Yeah, yeah. Singer Texaco present. Star Theater and they, they love the idea, yeah. you know? And yeah. I said, you know, you're cr now they're creatively vested and we didn't just do a music show. We, d we got Rob Marshall from, you know, Chicago and he had just done Geisha the movie to direct this and uh, we won nine Emmys, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and did quite well. Um, is it tough to do? Yeah, it's tough to pull off, but like, you know. Uh, but it feels like there's a huge, else. so what you're describing though feels like a huge missed opportunity. You know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, MTV seemed central to the music business. Yeah, it, it, stay, where do you where do you what, you like, stay in front what, of what, what what MTV the old joke is you know I, I remember MTV when they actually you know had music on there. Um, yeah, yeah. Where's the music in TV much any you know today? Well, look, we, we there's no no joke. We used to have three networks and now there's, there's eight hundred yeah, opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan, you had seventy million people right. tune in. Yeah. Um, well, they had they could watch Bonanza and they could, you know. Um, so that we don't have that anymore. Right. So it's it's desperate, and 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 again, getting everybody into one area. But you know, Ted Sarandos brilliantly in terms of the you know understanding the the idea of streaming, and understanding that people don't nest, don't have brand loyalty anymore. So it, it what we can do now is have it when we want it. And if you want to watch Breaking Bad through the whole thing. <clears throat> you can and will, or hearts of cards. Yeah. There it is, yeah. and it's a it's a different way of thinking. No LPs anymore. Um, we're kind of back to singles, and now it's up to the artist to make sure that every song they do is a single, which is back to the Beatles. Well, Danny, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, really appreciate you being here, and thank you for joining us tonight on CITI Media Reporter. I'm Howard Hominoff. Good night.